Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for this amazing uh, opportunity to hear from you through Shane. Thank you for the gifting that's in him, the heart that's in him, the ministry that uh, you have built through him. And I thank you that you use people, broken people. We're just messed up, and yet we get to make a difference for you. And so I pray tonight that in this unique setting, you show up with uh, a revelation for each of us, one-on-one -on -one encounter. Holy Spirit, one-on-one -on -one encounter. Quicken our hearts to hear from you, open our minds to draw from you, and let us leave here uh, challenged, ready to grow, uh, maybe even a little bit offended uh, because uh, we see an area that... Um, we need to change in our lives. Love you, Lord. Love what you're doing in City Church and in El Mirage. Bless us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. My friend. All right, good evening, everybody. If your type likes to follow an actual Bible, Ruth chapter four, um, I, want to, uh, I want to dig into, because I figured Saturday night this was the core, uh, the core group of the church. And so you guys are gonna be in a series on community. And community is one of those words um, that, we like to say, oh, we need more of it, but we don't really even know what that means. And so I want to put some language around what it means to be a church and what it means to be a community. And what the way I've chosen to do it is, is to talk about enemies of community. So tonight I want to talk to you about shame. I want to talk to you about um, um, that if people are afraid that there's something about them that means they won't belong to this world, that they it, it will kill your community, and what it means to overcome that. Uh, um, I want to, uh, to, not that I ever expect anybody to remember what I said last year. That is absurd. I understand that. But, um, but I want to build off something I, I talked about last year. Last year, in the morning sessions, in the master class, I talked about um, historical arc. And one of the examples I used is how... The, you can't see the Bible statically. You have to see it progressively because the Bible says that Moabites will never be welcomed by God. Uh, and obviously in Deuteronomy 23, it says no Moabite will ever be welcomed by God. Uh, obviously, that's not true. Uh, Ruth's a Moabite. David's a Moabite. Jesus is like 128th Moabite. And so you have to see the Bible as a whole um, instead of one individual verse. And so I want to, I wanna, uh, some of the insight on that um, created uh, good questions. And so I decided to write a whole series on the book of Ruth, and I released it since last time I was here. And I, I want to, so I want to build up onto that. So, uh, so uh, about three minutes of this will be a repeat of something I did last year. So no booing, because I know I'm repeating myself, but it's only three minutes of it. That the rest of the entire talk um, was built on what that discussion brought. Now, at the end of the session, um, on Saturday, what we do is we do Q&A, because here's what I find, okay, to, to go off what Russ said. Here's what I find. I find that afterwards, Lots of people ask me questions out there, and here's what I find. 90% of them are asking the same question. So, so I, I sit there and I answer the first time, and then the second time, it's the same question, but that person doesn't know the other person asks. And then the next time, it's the same question. And by the time it's the fourth or fifth time, I'm working hard at staying engaged because it's like, wait a minute. Like, but that person has no idea, right? And so um, what, the, what I find is the best is if we can have a Q&A in here where we just get all that out, right? We just, we just Because as long as it's non-antagonistic, Okay, so if you have a question, I want you to jot it down and keep it for the end. Do not raise your hand while I'm talking, okay? Um, uh, we'll, we'll do it at the end. It needs to be non-antagonistic, mutually edifying, and it needs to be a question, right? And it needs to be stated in uh, two or three sentences, okay? Because that's, it's called being pithy, right? And so we, we want to do that. All, all good Q&As are limited in scope, so try to limit your questions to what we're talking about. And, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll move forward that way because um, what, we're gonna have, what I'm going to say tonight has profound implications for how we do church and what it means to be a church in a community, all right? So uh, this is Root Chapter 4. Now, Root Chapter 4 is at the end of the book, all right? So I need to set it up because otherwise, if I just read Root Chapter 4, you'd be like, what, 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 what the heck's going on, all right? So if we could bring that first slide up. So the basic story up till now, here's the basic story. There's a family of four, they are Jewish people, and they don't have enough food to eat, so they go and take refuge in the country of Moab. The Jewish boys marry, marry Moabite women, all right? That was an absolute no-no. And then through a series of, of unfortunate events, every man in the story dies, leaving a bunch of single women in a world where single women did not weren't even people. The social historians called um, single women in the ancient world liminal, liminal people, okay? They didn't know what to do with women not attached to men. So the most basic thing going on in the book of Ruth is, is we gotta get Ruth a man because without a man, Ruth is not a person. That's, that's the idea, right? And so you have three single women who are now wanting to come back to 
Israel. One decides to stay in Moab. Ruth and Naomi decide to come back to Israel. The tension in the story comes from the book of Deuteronomy because in Jewish law, in Deuteronomy 23, it says no Moabite will ever be welcomed by God. Even 10 generations from now, God does not accept people of the Moabite race, right? And it had to do with an entire incident at a place called Shittim, which is funny. It had to do with an incident at Shittim that took four chapters of the book of Numbers to to talk about what happened. Essentially, the Moabites threw an outdoor orgy to honor their God, the of Peor, um, and the Moabite women convinced the Israelite men to participate in this. And because of that, Moses says, we got to protect Israel from Moabite women. So he says, no Moabite will ever be accepted by God. Ruth comes back into Israel, and the Israelites have to decide two things. One, if we are totally correct about Scripture, we should throw her out. The problem with that is, is that if they throw Ruth out, who's never born? David and Jesus. So that's a real problem. So they had a second option, which is instead of being right about the Bible, we can do something more profound than that and we can fulfill scripture. To fulfill scripture is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so one of the lessons we learned from this story is as a Christian who loves scripture, we should fulfill scripture instead of simply being right about it. To simply be right about scripture, they should have thrown Ruth out. They did not and thank goodness they didn't because we're still here doing what we're doing because they chose to fulfill scripture instead of simply being right about it. If you want to know what Jesus' entire message was in one sentence, it's simply this. Do not be people who are simply right about the Bible. Be people who fulfill Scripture. Jesus was a fulfiller of Scripture, not someone who was right about it. He didn't stone adulterers, even though the Bible said to. He allowed allowed Gentiles into the temple area, even though the Bible says that wasn't. He called Sidonites blessed, even though six places in the Old Testament, it says Sidonites are cursed, okay? Jesus was someone who fulfilled Scripture instead of simply being right about it. We also learned that evidently God loves people more than the rules. That, that, that the rules said that, that Ruth would never be welcome, but God evidently loves people more than what the rules say. And so Ruth comes in into a situation where they had every right to throw her out, but then they don't. And she, to be fair to Ruth, she doesn't make it hard for them to do that. She gains a good reputation. She works hard. She doesn't take advantage of generosity. She really, really is cool about, about this. She, she gained a good reputation of being a hardworking person of integrity. Um, it was really good. So one of the things you learn in this story, next slide, is, is, that, is that your behavior determines your reputation, but not your redemption. In this story, her redemption was based solely by grace on, the, on, the, on somebody else's compassion. But, but her reputation was determined by her behavior. And that is very important for us to stop and think about that. You never want to be a person who confuses reputation and redemption. Your redemption is always free, always by the grace of God, always can never be earned. But your reputation is determined by how you behave. And you don't want to be a someone who is forgiven, whose word means nothing, whose name means nothing. Your redemption is always always free, but your reputation is determined by your behavior. Now, what happens in this story is Naomi refocuses the story and says, remember, Ruth, you need a husband. That's the whole reason you're here. And and if you'll allow me to be candid with what happens, she says, hey, see that guy over there? Yep, his name's Boaz, right? First, he's single. Check. Second, he's rich. Check, check, right? Third, he has a reputation for being very kind. Check, check, check. So you got a single, rich, kind man. What else do you want, right? So Ruth says, well, what is the Israelite tradition for how women attract men? And evidently, the way for women to attract men is fairly universal in its language. So Naomi, this is the part I love about the Bible. The Bible tells the whole story. I love that. The Bible just doesn't tell the the successes. It tells the failures. It tells the shame. It tells the sin. It tells the victories. It tells the whole story. Because there's some things written in the Bible that, be honest, you're glad it wasn't written about you, right? Like, you wouldn't want everybody knowing this. So Naomi says, well, in Israel, here's how we attract men, right? Here's what you need to do. I'm almost quoting this verbatim, okay? Wait until the middle of the night when his heart is merry from too much drinking. That's called drunk. Climb under the covers with him. Uh huh. Lift the corner of his garment and uncover his feet. He will know what to do. Now, that is what you're thinking. 
Uh, uh, in, in ancient Jewish culture, they didn't speak of sexuality in literal terms. And frankly, neither do we. We don't speak of sex in straight literal terms. Nobody speaks of sex in straight literal terms unless you're Sheldon Cooper, okay? If you're Sheldon Cooper, you could be literal. But most of us speak of sexuality in metaphors and figures of speech because we're more comfortable with that. Same with the Jews. And actually, both major metaphors for sexuality are used in this passage. The first one is to lift the corner of the garment, right? So the corner of a garment in Hebrew is a canape. Think canopy, a canape. And in most cases, it's used literally like, hey, nice canape, right? Right? Like, hey, hey, nice canape. So when talking about the literal garment, it's, hey, nice canape. But to lift the canape um, was a metaphor for, it, it'd be like an American saying, hey, you want to go get busy. It, it, would be, it would be like that. To lift the canape was an invitation for sexuality. If, if you need a biblical reference for that, Deuteronomy 22 says, see to it that nobody commits adultery with a man by lifting the canape of his garment. Okay? So it's, it's just a metaphor for sexuality. So when Naomi says, lift the canape, let me, I'll do it in a way that you can remember. Okay? So sometime, most of the time, canape is, hey, nice canape. Sometimes canape is, canape, all right? So it's, it's, it's that. It's, 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 it's that kind of thing. So she says, lift the canape of the garment and uncover his feet. Now, feet is the other metaphor. Most of the time in the Bible, a foot is a foot, right? So just a, a foot is just a foot, right? And, and leave it a foot if it's a foot. But sometimes they use the word foot as a metaphor for, um, for genitalia or, or sexuality, right? And, and the context will be obvious. Like, it, it, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. It says that Saul went into the cave in English to relieve himself. Um, in, in Hebrew, it says Saul went into the cave and uncovered his feet, right? So right? So um, uh, in, in Song of Solomon, in Song of Solomon, it says that, that the guy came back, and he's come back from a long journey. He says to his wife, hey, do you want to make love? And she's like, make love. My feet are clean. Must I dirty them again? Uh, obviously, sex. So, so if it's obviously, if it's obviously you sexually, did, now, if it's not obvious, leave a foot a foot, okay? Don't read into it, right? Like, I'll give you an example. Um, if a very common Middle Eastern uh, tradition was to do a foot washing. That, that, was, that was actually feet, okay? Like, Jesus washed his disciples' actual feet, right? He wasn't like, oh, man, gosh. Oh, my, man. I hate this part of being a rabbi. This job sucks. No, it's just like, this is actual feet, now, um, I, I add that illustration because I was teaching this one time and I never thought about it, but somebody came to me afterwards and said, so is Jesus washing his disciples' actual feet? I'm thinking, and they were being serious. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? So I add that for clarity, okay? <laughs> Foot washing in the Middle East was feet. Okay, so, so Naomi says, go lift the canape of his garment and uncover his feet. He'll know what to do. Now, I want to be very clear about this. Ruth is not asking him to marry her. Go back and read the story. She doesn't say, will you marry me? She tells him he has to. She says, I know the law. The closest redeemer must redeem me. So redeem me. Right? Now, here's the problem with that. She only knew part of the law. The law in Deuteronomy said that for the kinsman redeemer to be enforced, it has to be done in the middle of the day at the town gate in front of 10 witnesses. She's trying to pull this off in the middle of the night with nobody around. It would have been illegal. She could have been put to death. So he says, he says, he says, Ruth, I really love you. I want this to be legal because I really love you. I need you to go. I promise you tomorrow we'll do this at the town gate in front of 10 witnesses so it's legal. I really want this to be legal because I love you and I don't want you to be put to death. You need to sneak out of here so that they don't put you to death. So when you get to heaven one day and you see a guy you've never met before with the hugest self-control medal ever, Boaz, okay? That's Boaz, Boaz. So, so she, he sends her out, sneaks her out, and then the next day... He does the meeting in a legal way. That's where we're up to. This is Ruth chapter four. Here we go. Now, Boaz had gone up to the town gate and sat down, and behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz spoken of came by. Oh, the only part I left off was evidently Boaz was not the closest redeemer. There was one before him, and so he had to give him the right first, okay? And so Boaz said, turn aside, friend, you sit down here, and he turned aside, and then he took 10 men of elders and said, and said that you guys sit down here. So the law in Deuteronomy said you gotta have 10 witnesses at the town gate in the middle of the day. This is now a legal proceeding, okay? Next slide. 
Uh, Then he said to the Redeemer, notice the Redeemer's never named, it's just the Redeemer. Uh, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling a parcel of land that belonged to Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, now you could buy it in the presence of these sitting here and in the presence of the elders. If you'll redeem it, then do so. But if you will not, then tell me that I can redeem it. Because there's no one besides you than me, and I come after you. Right? And so the guy says, I will redeem it. Now, in other words, let me just summarize that. There's a piece of land that legally belongs to you. Do you want it? Yes, I like land. I'll take the land. Absolutely. Now he, Then he tells him the whole deal. Watch this. Next slide. Then Boaz said, well, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead and the inheritance. Oh, so you want the land. Yes. Oh, but you got to have Ruth. Oh, and by the way, Ruth's a Moabite. You know the one that our law curses? Oh, and by the way, she's childless. Oh, by the way, the kinsman redeemer law says that if she's childless, you have to produce children with her and you have to give those children the equal inheritance from your other children. So so your full-blooded Jewish children will have to share the inheritance with the half Moabite children. Now watch how fast he backtracks. Then the redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, (laughs) lest I impair my own inheritance. In English, it says, lest I impair my own inheritance. The literal Hebrew there is, is she's a bad investment. This is a bad investment. This, she's not worth the risk. First, she's a Moabite. Second, I'm bringing a cursed person into my business affairs. What if God doesn't approve of this? Third, I'm going to have to give half-caste children the same inheritance as I give my full-blooded Jewish children. This is impairing my entire business operation. No, no, no. She is not worth the risk. She's a bad investment, right? Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, watch what happens. Now, this was the custom in former times concerning uh, redeeming and exchanging. By the way, this is how you know the book of Ruth was written way, way, way later, because the writers have to explain an ancient custom to the audience that this custom didn't exist anymore, right? Um, to confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. That, like today, we have contracts. Back then, they just took off their sandals in front of witnesses. Weird, right? Primitive. So when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he draws off his sandal, right? Essentially, you don't want this deal, I'll take this deal. You don't understand how much this woman loves canape. You don't understand, this is gonna be great, right? So he takes off his sandal. Now, then Boaz makes a declaration. This would be a court statement. This would be like us making a statement in court, right? Here's what he says. Your witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi, all that belong to Limelech, Kion, and Mayan, also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Mayan, I bought her to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead and the inheritance. In other words, I commit to having children. Uh, the name of the dead may not be cut off from amongst the brothers of the na- gate of the native place. Your witnesses, keep going, your witnesses this day. Now, a couple of observations about this that I think is so profound. Next slide. This is an ancient story that's behaving like one. A woman is being discussed as property. If that turns your stomach, it should, but that's how it was in the ancient world. If you think the world's getting worse, not better, Think about that. You don't want to be a woman back then. Shoot, you don't want to be a woman in 1950. It's a whole lot better to be a woman today than back then. Medicine is better. Medicine is way better. You definitely would rather have a colonoscopy today than in 1950 or in 1850. You definitely rather have dental work today than in 1950 or in 1850. The world's getting better, right? right? The redeemer in this story is happy to take the land, but not Ruth. He calls her a bad investment. He says, no, no, you're, you're not worth it. You're not worth the risk. Now, what I found interesting was the Redeemer's never named. He just says the Redeemer five times. The Redeemer, the Redeemer. So I went and looked up it. I looked it up in the original language, and the Redeemer's name is Poloni Al Maloney. <laughs> what a terrible name, right? I, who does that to a kid? Oh, he's beautiful. I'll name him Poloni Al Maloney, right? right? So I put my history researchers on this because I thought maybe there's a history here That explains why he turned the whole thing down. And do you know what? There is not one mention in any Jewish history book ever of who Poloni Almoloni is. Not one. You do not know who this guy is. There's only one vague mention of his uncle. His uncle, next slide, is named Patty O. Maloney, right? (laughs) Who, who of course, next slide, is a drunk Irishman who abuses people at parties. (laughs) Now, uh, no, I'm just joking. Next slide. I, I... I made the Patio Maloney thing up. All right, P- Poloni Al Maloney, that is actually his name in Hebrew, but in Hebrew, Poloni Al Maloney is so-and-so, such-and-so. It's John Doe. To this day in Israel, an unidentified body is a Poloni Al Maloney. It's like saying that, uh, 
uh, that brother over there, or that, uh, or hey Bubba, or or hey bro, or John Doe, a nameless person. So in this story, Poloni Al Maloney says that Ruth is a bad investment. The one not even worth naming is saying she's not worth it, which leads me to all kinds of questions about what it means for us to be a church of Jesus Christ in our communities. Uh, ne- next slide. Have we ever been told by someone not important enough to name that you're not worth it? Have you ever been told by somebody not even important enough to remember their name? Has anybody not, even, not important enough to name made you feel worse about yourself? Or, or maybe, let's say it this way. Have we ever been guilty of gauging relationships based on economic value alone? In this story, Ruth's belonging is questioned based on her lack of ability to bring economic value to the story. Has the, have we ever done that? Have we ever decided who's in and who's out of our world based on perceived ability to bring economic value to the situation? And if we have, then we have become the Poloni Al Maloney. As a church, do we decide who can come and who can't come based on their ability to provide money for our mission? Have we, have we ever been guilty of, of you're in, you're out based on economic, because that's what's happening in the story. What's happening in the story is profound primitive racism. You're a Moabite, you're not worth the risk because you cannot bring economics to this situation because this isn't relevant today at all, is it? But hey, let's say it this way. Have we ever shunned someone because of the social stigma around them? In Ruth's world, being a Moabite in Israel was social stigma. In our world, we have other people who have certain social stigmas. Have we ever shunned them because of that? Let's let's be even more specific. Next slide. So the bank tells you that you're too big of a risk. You don't qualify. So, So you go put your whole financial world in the hands of a guy who you wouldn't even know his name had he not have a name tag on. And he says, I'm sorry, Bank of America determines you are not worth the risk. Bye. That is Poloni Al Maloney. You go to a networking event and you're embarrassed by your name tag or title. You're like, Dr. Joe, Lawyer Jane, Businessman Bill. And you're like, oh, no. And a group of people, you wouldn't even know who they are had they not had a name tag on is making you feel worse about yourself. That is Poloni, Al Maloney. When asked, what do you do? You recoil. Next slide. You're targeted in the office by bullies who are simply envious of your promotion. So you get promoted and, and nameless people start gossiping and rumoring and things like this, slandering. Poloni Al Maloney. Or we behave in some destructive way because of some deep desire to please our father, yet no one around even knows his name. It's Poloni Al Maloney. I think this, this, this story has a lot to teach us about community, about belonging. One of the top three uh, basic hierarchical needs of a human being is to feel like they belong to something. And so if belonging and community are, are symbiotic units, then the enemy of that is shame. It's shame. Let, let's, let's, let's go to the next slide. So shame is one of those things that we know is bad. We know, we like, oh, you shouldn't feel ashamed. We use, but we don't have much language to talk about it until now. There's been some big research over the last three years uh, trying to put language around shame. This is my favorite definition of shame because it, it allows us to talk about it. Shame is the manifestation of the fear of not belonging. That's shame. So when there's something about you that you think threatens belonging to that group, this is why when you meet a new group of people and you do not care whether you belong to their world, you just sort of let it all hang out. But when you meet a new group of people and you actually are caring about whether you belong to their world, you do not let it all hang out. You hang back and you see what's acceptable and what's unacceptable because you desperately want to belong to their world. That's shame. Shame is the fear of not belonging, which leads me to this question. In what ways and how can the church of Jesus Christ remove the fear of belonging from those on the outside? Let me be very clear about this. Gone, and I mean gone, are the days. Church 35 years ago operated like this. If you're behaving correctly, like if you behave like us, you're welcome here, And then we'll teach you to believe like us. And if you do that, then you belong. You behave first, you believe, you belong, right? Those days are gone. 
Relevant churches are very clear about this now that you can belong before you believe and you can believe before you become anything. How else is people, are people supposed to ever change and be revolutionized by the presence of the risen Christ if, they, if they're not even allowed to show up? If there's a fear of belonging. One of the ways that churches are doing community now, and it's very, very effective, is they communicate very clearly to the outside world, no matter what's true about you, no matter what's true about your story, no matter where you came from, no matter what you believe, you can belong here. And we are going to trust God to do all the convicting and all the changing necessary in your life, because he's really good at that, and we're really bad at that. But there is no shame. You have no fear of not belonging in our church. And listen, I know your pastor for 12 years. I know. And I want to be very clear about this. Because I know your pastor, I know that this would not be a problem in this room. I know that no one in this room would ever tell a homosexual, you cannot belong here because of something about you. I know that, right? And if you're not there, I can tell you, you do not have the heart of this house, okay? I know, I know that no one in this room would say, oh, because you used to be an addict six years ago, you're not allowed to belong here. I know that that would never go on here, okay? I know that, and that's not my point. My point is not, is it going on in you? My point is, how far are we willing to go to make sure they know that there's no fear of not belonging, right? It's one thing for you to know something's true. It's a whole whole nother thing to take the steps necessary to make sure they know that there's no fear of not belonging. In case you're not tracking with me, okay, I want to be very specific about what I'm talking about. Shame is the fear of not belonging. Essentially, if they knew something about me, would they not welcome me? So let's be very specific. I want to put specific language around this. What if they found out blank about me, would I belong? So what if they found out I was a homosexual? Would they allow me to belong to their world or would they shun me because of that thing about me? Or what if they found out I was divorced? How much of my past can I actually say before they shun me or is is belonging threatened? Or or what if they found out I was from a broken home? Or, Or what if they found out my last name was different than my mom's? A lot of these shame studies show that one of the sources of shame in in elementary students is when their last name is different than their mother's last name because they think that makes them different from everybody else. Um, what, 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 if, what if they found out I was a convicted criminal? What if they found out I was a former prostitute? Would they welcome me? What if they found out I was a current prostitute? What if they found out I was an addict? What would happen then? What if they found out I had a sex change 10 years ago? One of the most moving things I've ever seen in a church, it was 14 years ago. I want you to think about this. 14 years ago, this was so ahead of the curve. So I walked into a church and there were two women who, who used to be men, and it was obvious. Like, it wasn't like, mm, I wonder. No, no. Put a dress on him in there. Okay, all right, so it was, all right, and, and it was, like, no offense, but you would be one ugly woman, mate. Like, <laughs> like I know, no offense, but you, good God. Anyway, so there was two women who used to be men, and it was obvious, But as I observed, they were in leadership. One was running the entire hospitality team. One was running an entire ministry. And I thought, Flip, this is inspiring. So how many of you know there's a story there, right? So I went to lunch with the pastor, and I was like, what's the story? Like, honestly, there's a story. What's the story? He said, you wouldn't believe this. He said, 10 years ago, they both had a sex change. They didn't know each other. They both had a sex change. Then they moved to this, to this area, and people who've had that operation, they tend to fight. They hang out in groups because where else do they belong, right? And he said they met each other, and, um, and then so that was 10 years ago. Four years ago, they had a radical encounter with Jesus Christ and gave their heart to Jesus four years ago. You can't go back, right? And he said, and then two years ago, they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and were completely filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, I just figured. And then, and then they started coming to church. And of course, people were like, so I just went and met with them and said, tell me your story. And that was their story. 10 years ago, sex change. Four years ago, radical encounter with the risen Christ. Two years ago, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he said, I sat there with coffee in my hand and I went, if God saw fit to fill them with the Holy Spirit, who am I to question them? And, um, and, and he welcomed them in full leadership just as they 
were. And I thought that is, I got goosebumps right now because I, I was there. I, I'm telling you, that was profoundly compassionate. Profoundly compassionate. What if they found out what I actually ate and drank? Would they accept me? This is true on microcosmic levels as well. Like, this is why the people who norm, people who need the gym the most tend to not go, right? Shame, fear of not belonging. What they found out was that women don't like to be gawked at by men. And more importantly, they don't like to be compared to the really fit girl on the treadmill next to them. So what gym people did is they created all female gyms and it took off. All male gyms, bad idea, right? <laughs> right? This is true of money. Have you ever been in a group of people and you realize that they all had money and then you wonder, I wonder if they are welcoming me because they think I have money. What if they found out I don't have money? Would I not belong? This is true of attraction. This is how attraction works, right? So you're in a group of people and there's this girl, right? And let's say for the sake of example, she's 10 times prettier than you are good looking, right? And so you look at her and you're like, shoot, she's way out of my league. But then as you're hanging out, there's chemistry, like, you find her easy to talk to. Jokes easily come to your head, right? Right? You talk to her, she talks to you, right? You're like, is this actually happening? And then one thing leads to another. You end up at dinner in a group of people. So you're with a group of people, and she sits next to you. And under the dinner table, her leg rubs yours. <laughs> and I'm not talking about like this. I'm talking about this one, right? And you're like, shoot. Did that, was that an accident? Did that actually happen? And then one thing leads to another, and you're having a conversation, and you're like, so what did you get up to today? And she's like, well, I got up at 4.15 to make it to my 4.30 CrossFit class so I could be done by 5.15 to make it to my hot yoga class at 5.30, which I teach. And you're like, shoot. <laughs> and then one thing leads to another. And you end up on a first date. First dates are hilarious. Like, like, like all you married women, every married, every married woman in this room will remember her first date with her husband, right? Men don't remember that, right? They don't remember that. And don't judge us for that. It's not that we don't love you. It's we don't remember all that crap, okay? <laughs> but, but women remember their first date. And you married women, I want you to think about it, right? Think about what you know about your husband now, right? Think about it, right? Think about your first date now. Did he dress how he actually wanted to? No. Why? Shame. He was afraid of not belonging to your world, right? Did he order what he actually wanted to eat? No. Why? Shame, right? Right. No way. No way. Did he smell like he actually normally smells? No. Why? Shame. Did he do the things back then in the car that he does today in the car after the meal? No. Why? Shame. He's afraid of not belonging to your world. So shame affects the way we present ourselves on the first date. So you get your first date with this girl. And you're like, shoot. And you start thinking, oh no. She's made of pure muscle and prettiness. And I'm made of pudding and pork. <laughs> She's going to work this out. So I mean, the whole next day, your abs are sore from sucking it in all night. And, and, what, and think about what you order. You're like, the, the waiter comes around. And she, he says, what can, I, what can I get you? And you're like, well, I'll have a half a grilled chicken breast on one of those skewer things with like bell pepper in between with a half a order of rice pilaf and a broccoli, right? Why would you order that? Shame. The fear of not belonging to her world. Well, one thing leads to another. You end up marrying this girl, Right? And five years later, you go back to that same restaurant to celebrate your anniversary because she reminds you it's where you had your first date, right? <laughs> now think about that. Five years later, you're married. Does he order the same thing? No way! He's like, I'll have 20 chicken wings, a large French fry, and a beer, right? And she's like, you're disgusting. Have you no shame? And he's like, nope, you married me. You stuck with me now, right? Right? <laughs> Once you remove the fear of not belonging, you get to what the person's actually like. What would happen if we could do that, if we were brave enough to do that in our communities? What if we were able to, and once again, I want to be very clear, because I don't want you to think I'm coming down on anybody. I know that that's not an issue in here. And if it is, fix it. I know it's not. That's not my question. 
My question is, how far has this community went to communicate that to those on the outside? That no matter what your story is, there's no fear of not belonging here. There's no fear of not belonging here. What would happen if we could do that? Um, one researcher pointed something out. I, I love this. Next slide. She, she, sh- she said that there's only one variable that separates people who report having a profound sense of love and belonging and people who report those things are absent. The only variable was not money, social economic status, education. It wasn't any of that. The only variable was, was that people that report belonging have an inner belief that they're worth it. What's happening in this story is a nameless person is saying she's not worth the risk, but the real redeemer is saying, yes, you're risky, but you are worth it. If you wanna know Jesus' message in one nutshell, here's what he said. He said, if you wanna know what God's like, look at birds and look at flowers. They do nothing to deserve it, but God feeds them and clothes them because they're worth it. How much more are you worth than that? Essentially, Jesus said, if you wanna know what God's like, God treats people as they are worth and never as they deserve. God treats people as they're worth and never as they deserve. The gospel message is, yes, you deserve death, but the whole story is, is God's not gonna give you what you deserve. God's gonna treat you how you're worth. Be very wary of Christians who only point out the verses that tell people what they deserve. Yes, the Bible has verses that tells people what they deserve. Grace means nothing if you don't create a picture of what you deserve. But the whole gospel story is that God does not treat people how they deserve. God always treats people how they are worth. How have we communicated that to those on the out? side. Where can we communicate? Yes, you're risky, but you're worth it here. Next slide. So Boaz walks up to the city gate and tells people what to do, and they do it. He's obviously a man of high influence. He's tour observant even to the greater generosity. This man snuck Ruth out of the threshing floor to make it legal. He's obviously a conscientious sort of man. He's following the rules to make everything legal. Next slide. Uh, Boaz not only lets her into her household and takes care of her, he marries her. He's going way over the top to show generosity, which leads me to this question. Why did someone write this story down? Like several hundred years later, somebody said, you know what? That story needs to be written down. We got to tell that story. And in ancient Jewish thought, if someone years later wrote a story down like this, they were trying to communicate something about God. Which leads me to this question, what is the writer of this story trying to tell us about the character of God? And I love the way the ancient rabbis teach this story, and since it's their book, I'm not going to change it because it's just awesome. It's awesome. Here's what the ancient rabbis say. The ancient rabbis say that this story is revealing that God is a God of chesed. Let me show you that word in Hebrew. Next slide. Chesed. C-H-E-S-E-D. Chesed. In Hebrew, H is a K, is a K, like that. It's a K, said, K said. In English, I realized that says cheesed. That's why I said the word before I showed it to you. It's like cheesed. Who's che-? we don't want to be cheesed? No, it's K said, right? K said is loving kindness, unmerited kindness. It's generosity. In the pictures, it's a swan plucking its feathers off of itself at great pain in order to make a bed for its young. In other words, K said is any time you humble yourself and experience a little bit of pain yourself so that someone else can be comfortable. So that someone else can, can it, it's, 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 the, it's a church, a church of Kassed is a church that is willing to humble itself, feel a little bit of pain so that our outside community can feel welcome here. What, what, what pain are we willing to feel so that other people who would otherwise not feel welcome can feel welcome? That God is a God of Kassed, a God of loving kindness, a God that says you're worth the risk, that Boaz in this story is the redeemer character. He's the one saying, yes, you're risky. Yes, you have baggage. Yes, you're bringing a certain amount of risk to my world. But you are worth the risk. How can we communicate that to someone on the outside? Because if God is a God of Kassed and we are meant to be a church of God, then we must be a people of Kassed. That you cannot have community without Kassed. It is impossible to have community where there's a fear of not belonging because of something about us. It's impossible. That's called shame. That's called shame. You cannot have community unless you have kased. Community is found when a group of people collectively are willing to humble themselves and experience a little bit of pain for the sake of someone else's comfort. That is kased. That is what God is like. Jesus took this obviously to the extreme. And, he, and instead of watching the world suffer, he entered into a suffering world and he screamed alongside of it, you are worth the risk. You're worth dying for. You're worth dying for. I will experience pain on myself 
so that you can experience comfort. For a church of Jesus Christ or a church of God to be anything close to a community God would uh, env- envisualize, we, has to, we must be a people of Kassed, a people who don't push our own way, who don't push our own preferences, but are willing to humble ourselves for the sake of someone else knowing that they belong. Let, let's say it this way. Next slide. Because God says you're worth it, can you believe that you're worthy of love and belonging? That's the point of the whole story of Ruth and the gospel, by the way. No, you don't deserve it. Yes, you are risky. Yes, it would take you all to carry your baggage around, but you are worth the risk. And if God says you're worth the risk, can we believe that we're worth loving and belonging? And, and in so forth, uh, we can feel a, a deeper sense of loving and belonging. Maybe we can say it this way. Who is Poloni Al Maloney to you? Who's the nameless person who's making you feel worse about yourself? It, who is that person that, who's that person that voice, their voice needs to get quieter? Who's, whose voice needs to get quieter? Where, where have we sided with the nameless redeemer instead of the one who's willing to be named and stand up for us in a public court? Where, where's that? Maybe one of the more convicting questions is this. Who are we being Poloni Al Maloney to? Is there, any, is there any person or group of people who would feel less than welcome in our churches because of something about them? Um, obviously, obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is the homosexual community. It's like wait, they, feel, they feel less than welcome in our churches because the Bible forbids something about them. But the Bible also forbids gluttony. 25 times more than homosexuality, by the way. So how should you treat homosexuals when they come in? The same way you treat unrepentant overeaters. The same way you treat unrepentant overeaters. And obviously we don't have a big problem with that. What should we say to unrepentant overeaters? Well, you're welcome here as long as you know exactly where we stand on your choice to eat. No. What we do is we say, you're welcome here. And any changing and any convicting that God needs to do, we're gonna trust God to do that. We're gonna expose you to the presence of God. We're gonna expose you to the truth of God. We're gonna expose you to all that. And then we're gonna back off and we're gonna let God do all the convicting and all the changing because he's really, really good at it and we're really, really not. But you belong here. We love you. We love you. We love you. Is there anybody or any group of people that we are being Poloni El Maloney to? Is there any group of people who would, who would feel, I'd love to go there, but I'm not sure I could and once again, I've, this is the third time I've said it because I want to be very clear. I know that none of you would feel that way. I do. I do. Because I know him. And you can't hang out with him if you're going to feel that way. And you definitely can't hang out with me. Um, although you only have to put up with me two days a year. But I'm a little bit easier. But, but I know it's not. But my, my question is, do they know it? You would agree with me that because of the internet, they would have a reason to believe they wouldn't be welcome here. Because loud people say stupid things that are unfiltered online. How far are we willing to go? Because you can't have community if you don't have cassette. And you can't have cassette if you're not willing to have a little bit of pain yourself so someone else can feel comfortable. Um, let, let's, let me, let's say it this way. Next, next slide. Jesus did not die simply to forgive us, although we embrace that. We say yes and amen to that. Jesus didn't die simply to forgive us, but also to challenge the so-and-sos along the way to scream, you're worth loving. How can we reflect that this week to someone on the outside? Yeah. How do you have community? Within these four walls, you have community how? By like said, you prefer others better than yourself. It's a very Christian idea. How do you have community with them? You communicate clearly that regardless of your story, you have no fear of belonging here. Oh, you're an unrepentant overeater and the Bible forbids that? Okay, but you still belong here. Oh, you haven't con- totally conquered that anger problem. The Bible forbids that. Yes. Okay. But you still belong here because we believe that the spirit of the risen Christ is a revolutionary thing in our life. May we be those people who build community. Um, so just to review today, um, what, how, how do we, how, how do we uh, combat um, things that will kill community? Well, one, we never let people suffer alone. We engage suffering, not to solve it, not to solve it, but to let people know you are not alone. Through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for your deliverance. Clean hands, pure heart, great taste. Um, be vested in other people's deliverance. How do, how do we build a great community? Well, we remove shame. How do we remove shame? We remove all fear of not belonging. All fear of not belonging. And we can have community. How do you do that? Cassette. 
be people of Kesed. Why? Because God's a God of Kesed.